Christ. I'm not saying I'm going to rule the world or I'm going to change the world, but I guarantee that I will spark the, the, the brain that will change the world. And that's our job, is to spark somebody else watching us. For hip-hop fans, his name is legendary. Tupac and Machiavelli were the stage names under which he rose to fame and recorded albums, two of which went platinum. More than 70 million CDs of this artist have been sold. In the list of 100 immortal musicians, which is compiled by Rolling Stone, he took the 86th position. What kind of person was Tupac Shakur? How did his childhood affect him, and was he doomed to such an end? You can find out about all this in our video today. You're on the Enco Stories. We're starting. One of the most talented representatives of the rap community was born on June 16, 1971 in New York's criminally disadvantaged neighborhood of Harlem. His birth name was Lassane Parrish Crooks. The name under which he became famous he was given at baptism. In memory of the South American revolutionary of the 18th century, Tupac Amaru II. It roughly means shining serpent, grateful to the god, with the surname of the stepfather. Mother often moved from place to place. Afini Shakur was an activist of the movement that defended the rights of blacks under the name Black Panther. Thanks to the assistance of his mother, Tupac later joined this organization who soon had a tattoo in the form of a Black Panther. Shakur was born a month after his mother and 20 other Black Panthers were acquitted in the case on charges of conspiracy against the United States government and New York landmarks. Shakur later stated that his mother was the source of his anger, but also his greatest inspiration. What made Tupac so great was everything she gave him, good, bad, and ugly. Alan Hughes said about their relationship. After becoming famous, Tupac arranged for her to receive her monthly payment of $16,000 and bought her a house in Stone Mountain, Georgia. As for his biological father, Billy Garland, Tupac didn't know him at all. But he was close to his stepfather, Mutulu, who lived with them for many years. From an early age, Shakur lived with people who had convictions for serious criminal offenses. In my family, every black male with the last name of Shakur that ever passed the age of 15 has either been killed or put in jail," Tupac once said. There are no Shakurs, black male Shakurs, out right now, free, breathing without bullet holes in them or cuffs on his hands. None. His godfather, Elmer Geronimo Pratt, was convicted of murdering a schoolteacher during a robbery in 1968, although the conviction was later overturned. His stepfather, Matulu, spent four years on the run, being on the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitive lists since 1982. Matulu was wanted for helping his sister, Asada, escape from prison in New Jersey. She was jailed for the murder of a police officer in 1973. Matulu was later caught in 1986 and jailed for robbing a Brinks armored truck, during which two policemen and a security guard were killed. Shakur had a half-sister, Takiwa, two years younger than him, and an older half-brother, Moprim Komani. The phrase black power was like a lullaby when I was a kid, Tupac recalled in an affidavit he gave in 1995. Afini tried to give her son a good education despite her limited finances and surroundings. When the boy was 10 years old, Matulu also left his family, going underground after a robbery. But they did not break the connection and remained on good terms. Matulu later said that if he felt that Tupac needed him, he would do whatever I had to get there, even if it was just so that the boy could see him. Another person who left his mark on the formation of Tupac was the dealer, Logs, with whom his mother had an affair. Although it was difficult to call it a novel, all their interaction consisted in the joint use of prohibited substances. But the boy became very attached to Logs, calling him father. Therefore, his death greatly affected Tupac and became a great loss for him. At the age of 12, Shakur entered the Harlem Repertory Ensemble and got the role of Travis Younger in the play A Raisin in the Sun, which was performed at the Apollo Theater, which was how Tupac's craving for creativity began. In 1986, the family leaved to Baltimore, Maryland. After graduating from the second grade of Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School, he transferred to the Baltimore School for the Arts, where he studied acting, poetry, jazz, and ballet. He also played in Shakespeare's plays and performed the role of the Mouse King in the ballet The Nutcracker. The artist recalled that life in Baltimore was not easy. We didn't have any lights. I used to sit outside by the streetlights and read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and it changed me. By the way, Shakur's love for theater and Shakespeare definitely influenced his work, because he understood the Shakespearean psychology of inter-clan wars and intercultural conflicts. Later, the rapper gave an interview in which he said, I love Shakespeare. He wrote some of the raw stories, man. I mean, look at Romeo and Juliet, that's some serious ghetto shit. 
You got this guy Romeo from the Bloods, who falls for Juliet, a female from the Crips, and everybody in both gangs is against them. So they have to sneak out and they end up dead for nothing. Real tragic stuff. A young and talented guy in the company of one of his friends, Dana Smith, became interested in beatboxing. He won many rap competitions and was considered the best rapper in his school. He was remembered as one of the most popular guys thanks to his sense of humor, excellent rap skills, and ability to blend in with any crowd. At the same time, he formed a close friendship with the young Jada Pinkett, which lasted until his death. In the documentary Tupac Resurrection, Shakur said, Jada is my heart. She will be my friend for my whole life. Jada and Tupac were very close. The actress said that he was like a brother to her. It was beyond friendship for us. The type of relationship we had, you only get that once in a lifetime, she admitted. During the same period of his life, Tupac found not only his best friend, but also his first love. While studying at art school, Shakur became a member of the Baltimore Young Communist League USA and began dating the daughter of the director of the local Communist Party. But in June 1988, Shakur and his family moved to Marin City in California, five miles north of San Francisco. At his new school, Tupac met rapper Ray Love and, together with their mutual friend DJ Dyes, founded the rap group Strictly Dope. It was there that he first got into the police reports. Unable to pay tuition and having bad marks, the future star decided to follow a familiar path and sell illegal substances, but he didn't do it for long. A few weeks later, his dealer came to him and asked him to return the goods. Rumor had it that dealers paid him to mind his own business and find his passion. In 1989, Tupac began attending Layla Steinberg's poetry classes. Their creative union was considered as controversial as possible and did not fit into the hip-hop culture at all. For a while, he even lived with her, read and wrote, inspired by her image. It was on this contradiction that the image of Tupac was built. Some people say I was a thug and a gangster. Other people remember me as a poet and a born leader. But I'm saying to you, measure a man by his actions fully, through his whole life, from the beginning to the end. In the same 1989, Steinberg organized a concert with Shakur's band Strictly Dope, and this led to the fact that he signed a contract with a representative of the rap group Digital Underground Atrin Gregory. He arranged for the aspiring artist as a guest performer and backup dancer in the young rap group Digital Underground in 1990. Shakur's professional career in the entertainment industry began thanks to his participation in the digital underground under the pseudonym MC New York. His debut was the song named Same Song in their 1991 mini-album This Is An EP release, and the soundtrack to the film Nothing But Trouble in which he also starred. In the same year, Tupac took his first independent steps in the world of music. He debuted with a solo CD, Tupacalypse Now, basing the name on an analogy with the picture Apocalypse Today. At the same time, the stage name Tupac appeared. The lyrics of the songs touched on the social problems faced by modern society, such as racism, police brutality, poverty, and much more. The daring album soon became gold. Many rappers, such as Nas, Eminem, Game, and Talib Kweli, pointed to him as a source of inspiration, but the album caused heated controversy. Dan Quayle, who at the time was the Vice President of the United States, criticized it after the lawyer of a Texas teenager said that it was influenced by Tupacalypse Now and the topic of police brutality before he shot a policeman. Quayle said, There's no reason for a record like this to be released. It has no place in our society. This did not prevent the album from being certified gold by the RIAA. Literally immediately after his debut in 1992, Tupac appeared in the film Juice in the title role. There, he played a gangster with psychological problems, doing arbitrariness and lawlessness. They said that this role had a decisive influence on the rest of the singer's life. Allegedly, the young man got used to it so much that it became his reality. What's up? I ain't seen in a couple days. What's been happening? Man, get off that shit. It's over. It ain't nothing nobody can do about it now. What do you want from me, man? Nothing. Just came to see if you was all right. According to the plot, Tupac's hero, Bishop, participated in the persecution and murder of members of other criminal groups. But in the end, a sad end awaited him. Despite the flourishing of his musical career, the rapper did not leave a life of crime and periodically went to jail. However, it was not for long. 
For example, after a performance in Marin City, there was a skirmish during which Shakur took out his registered Colt Mustang and then allegedly dropped it. When one of the members of his entourage raised a pistol, a shot occurred. A stray bullet killed six-year-old Kaid Walker Teal. Shakur and his half-brother Maurice Harding were arrested, but the charges were later dropped. It was reported that Shakur agreed to pay the parents of the murdered child compensation in the amount of $300,000 to $500,000. Shakur's father, Billy Garland, somehow decided to speak out, saying that his son's anger developed from his disappointment, that he was not understood, and it was for the same reason that he poured out this anger into music. He was overreacting when people questioned his commitment to the black community and the West Coast. In February 1993, Tupac released his second studio CD, which sold more than one million copies and made him a real star. The album surpassed the previous one, taking the 24th place on the Billboard 200. The album contained many tracks, emphasizing Tupac's political and social views, but there were noticeable differences in its production with its predecessor. While Tupac's first work had an indie rap sound, this album was considered more gangster-sounding. It was a breakthrough for him. In the same year, a new film with Shakur's participation, Poetic Justice, was released, which became a hit. Janet Jackson was also filmed in this film about love and violence, and she seemed to be wary of the young talent and demanded that Tupac be tested for HIV beforehand. He agreed to do this, but only if his sex with the singer was provided for her according to the script. Why are you always so mad? You must ain't got no man because you don't never smile. Do you? What do you want from me? During the filming of the movie, he was introduced to the aspiring, talented rapper Christopher Wallace, who later became known under the pseudonym The Notorious B.I.G. Tupac was already a major figure in the industry at that time, so B.I.G., who was just starting his career, was shocked when Shakur invited him to a party at his mansion. The rapper was even more surprised when, at a party, Pac invited guests to the kitchen where he cooked food himself. Biggie just couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. Tupac is in the kitchen and cooking for him. An intern from the label assigned to Biggie said in an interview, I remember Pac gave Biggie a bottle of Hennessy. It completely blew his mind. That's truly where Big and Pac's friendship started. The chemistry between the artists happened instantly. Biggie settled on Shakur's couch for almost a year, asking for advice on every step of his career, letting him listen to every demo. And Tupac stayed exclusively at Notorious's house on any visit to New York. Meanwhile, Tupac's creative piggy bank has been replenished with a film that has become a cult for basketball fans, Above the Rim. There, Tupac was true to his image. He played a crime boss named Birdie who has a great influence on the main character. Shakur has not been without scandals in the film industry either. He was supposed to star in the Hughes brothers' film Menace to Society, but after a quarrel with Alan Hughes, he was replaced by Lawrence Tate. As it was reported later, Tupac wanted to get another role, but Hughes did not obey his wishes, which led to a quarrel between them. And according to Tyron Turner, it also led to the fact that the actor, along with almost a dozen gang members, attacked the director. After that, Hughes admitted that it took him a long time to accept the situation, even after the rapper made a public apology. Shakur was punished for the attack. He was convicted and spent two weeks in prison. In 2013, Hughes said that Tupac would outshine other actors if he starred in the film because he was bigger than the movie. Hughes' comments were taken as confirmation that he forgave the rapper after the incident. Lawrence Tate, who had several rehearsals with Shakur before his role was reprised, recalled that Shakur was close to the Hughes brothers, but still, his actions were the result of creative differences and nothing more. In 2022, a miniseries about Shakur and his mother called Dear Mama, directed by Hughes, was released. The five-part documentary told about how Afeni and Tupac Shakur influenced American culture and told about the way Tupac became one of the greatest rap artists. The beginning of the 90s was both a triumphant and difficult time for Shakur. He reached glorious heights. The rapper and actor was in his prime, but problems with the law hindered his progress. In October 1993, Shakur was arrested for a shooting incident in Atlanta involving two off-duty police officers. According to witnesses, police officers Mark and Scott Whitwell, along with their wives, were crossing the street when they were almost hit by a car. The officers, who were in civilian clothes, got into a verbal altercation with the driver of the car and his passengers, as well as with the passengers of the second stopped car. The evidence of who fired the first shot and which car Shakur was in was unclear. However, when the fight escalated, Shakur wounded one policeman in the leg and another in the buttock. 
However, the charges were dropped when it was established that the police were intoxicated and had a weapon taken from the police evidence storage. The case in Atlanta made the rapper a hero in the eyes of some and a criminal in the eyes of others. According to Matulu, Tupac's actions finally cemented his status as not only a rapper, but a man who is true to his principles. After that, his listeners recognized Tupac as real, and those who did not like him began to respect him. It would seem that this could have been the end of visits to the police station, but a month later, the rapper was accused with a very serious charge. A girl named Ayana Jackson said that in 1993, she was sexually assaulted by Tupac Shakur and his friends. At that time, 19-year-old Ayana met a rapper at Nell's nightclub in Manhattan. After a short conversation, the girl refused to go somewhere private and left the club. But after a while, she accepted Tupac's invitation to meet in the Parker Meridian hotel room. According to Ayana, three of Shakur's friends unexpectedly joined them. As the woman stated, Shakur told her, Don't worry, baby. These are my brothers, and they ain't going to hurt you. We do everything together. Tupac denied the charges and claimed that the intimacy was consensual, but the court sentenced him to four and a half years in prison, of which he served only a year. Even before the sentencing, the artist managed to create a rap group called Thug Life and record several songs for his next album. The band recorded only one album and fans were offered several songs, including Bury Me as a G, Cradle to the Grave, Pour Out a Little Liquor, and How Long Will They Mourn Me. The album was originally released by Shakur's label, Out the Gutta Records, but due to criticism of gangster rap at the time, the original version of the album was cancelled and re-recorded. Many of the original songs were cut. The album included 10 tracks, and although the original version of the album was not completed, Tupac performed the planned first single from the album, Out on Bail, at the Source Awards ceremony in 1994. Thug Life lasted only a year. The band broke up after the rapper was jailed. After Shakur's release, he tried to reassemble the group, but by that time its members had engaged in a solo career. In total, the rapper had 12 arrests in 1993. Once, he even beat up a limo driver for forbidding Tupac to smoke weed in the car. And now we are approaching the story of an event that made its own adjustments to his path to triumph. As we have already said, almost from the very beginning of his acquaintance with the notorious B.I.G., Shakur became his close friend and advisor. In general, the guys were similar in worldview, creativity, and values. By and large, they had only one difference, but it was significant. Pac represented the community of rappers of the West Coast, while Biggie was a rapidly gaining momentum rapper of the East Coast. The conflict of the coasts in those years flared up more and more. However, friends did not pay attention to it at first. Although there were small arguments between the artists from time to time, for example, Biggie strongly disliked some people around Shakur and he warned his friend against communicating with these gangsters. The relationship remained based on mutual respect. Notorious did not miss the opportunity to express admiration for his, quote, big brother. But suddenly the friendship ended, and only in the eyes of one participant. On the night of November 30th, 1994, the day before the verdict in the sexual assault case was announced, Shakur was shot five times and robbed by two armed men in army uniforms. It happened after he entered the lobby of the Quad recording studio in Manhattan, where he was going to record a guest verse in Little Cease's track, Biggie's close friend and ward. The attackers took off all his jewelry and disappeared. The rapper later said that he pretended to be dead and waited until the attackers ran away. The guards were less lucky. They didn't have to pretend. The wounded Shakur got to the elevator and went up to the floor where the notorious B.I.G. and his producer Sean Combs were. Shakur claimed that they were discouraged and surprised by his appearance. It is not very clear, however, what other reaction he expected from people pouring blood all around. And this allegedly proved their involvement in the attack. Tupac blamed Notorious, Sean Combs, and another member of their label, Andre Harrell, because they were the ones he saw after the shooting. The rapper did not claim that they shot at him because it was impossible, but pointed to a possible setup. The artist also suspected another of his close friends and associates, Randy Stretch Walker, of involvement in the attack. There was also a theory that Biggie was not at the studio at all at the time of the robbery because he was late. However, Tupac also perceived this person as proof, claiming that Notorious was late because he knew about the upcoming shooting. Shakur was also sure that he recognized the attackers as someone from Biggie's entourage. This was the beginning of the end of a great friendship and the transition of the War of the Coasts to a fundamentally new level. Doctors claimed that Tupac miraculously survived, but this did not prevent the rapper from entering the courtroom in a wheelchair the very next day to be found guilty on three counts of harassment, but innocent on six others. Ironically, the other defendants in the case were exactly the same people from whom B.I.G. warned Shakur. However, the accused were quickly separated and only Tupac sat behind bars. 
and he, of course, immediately saw another setup. In his opinion, the girl was clearly in collusion with other participants. Hawk began serving a prison sentence on Rikers Island on February 14, 1995. In the same February 1995, Biggie released the track Who Shot Ya? It did not contain specific names, but everyone immediately decided that it was a diss on Shakur. Who Shot Ya? has become an iconic track for the War of the Coasts. Tupac, of course, could not accept the fact that once his friend, practically his younger brother, who made no attempt to deal with the attack on the studio, also released a provocative record. Biggie denied the subtext that everyone but him saw on the track, saying that Tupac is still his bro. The track was written the devil knows when, before all this. It's time to talk about all this properly for a long time. This is what I repeat to myself every day. I just need to talk to him. I have never dissed Pac and I will never believe that he thinks I could do this to him. Not to him. I couldn't. Of course, no one believed Biggie. Shakur himself reasonably remarked. Even if that song ain't about me, you should be like, I'm not putting it out because he might think it's about him. There was no clear opinion on whether Biggie was lying or not in the rap community. Of course, he should have thought carefully before releasing a track with that name. Nevertheless, according to colleagues of Notorious, the composition was recorded long before the attack on Tupac. Moreover, the song was originally intended for singer Mary J. Blige. Shakur, meanwhile, was serving his sentence in prison, and even there he managed to find problems. During his time in prison, the rapper has been in solitary confinement and in a high-security prison. Nevertheless, he wrote to the editor of Death Row Records magazine, Nina Bradeshwar, about his plans to start a new chapter of his life. And already in March of the same year, the rapper's fans heard the third album, Me Against the World, whose single, titled Dear Mama, took the first position in the rap song's chart. In this track, Shakur paid tribute to his mother, with whom he did not always have a good relationship. In the song, he reflected on his childhood, recognized Afini's problems with addiction, and expressed his love for her. Afini Shakur starred in the video for this song. When I was pregnant in jail, I thought I was going to have a baby and the baby would never be with me. But... The track topped the Hot Rap Singles chart and ranked ninth on the Billboard Hot 100. No less famous was the second single of the album, So Many Tears, which appeared a little later than the first one. The CD was released when the author was already behind bars, and thus Tupac became the first musician in the world to release his CD while in custody. Nevertheless, the album became the leader of various charts and went platinum. Fans and music critics called it the best of all Tupac's works. Over time, the album was included in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. By the way, not much was known about the artist's personal life since he has never got fixated on it. His main goal has always been a career. However, while serving this sentence, Tupac married his longtime girlfriend, Keisha Morris, but later he stated that this was done, quote, not at all for those reasons. After eight months spent behind bars, Shakur was released early thanks to a bail of about one and a half million dollars made by Suge Knight, the head of the Death Row record label. Of course, Suge did not do this out of the kindness of his heart, but on the condition that Shakur would sign a contract to release three new albums. Tupac pondered this proposal, realizing that a contract with Death Row was a contract with the devil. But Knight promised so much, grandiose fame and revenge on all his detractors. A few more years in prison were on the other scale, and Tupac gave up. There were also changes in his personal life. One day, while spending time in a bar, the musician met actress and model Kadada Jones, who was the daughter of record producer Quincy Jones and actress Peggy Lipton. A few years earlier, the rapper criticized Quincy Jones in an interview with The Source magazine, where he spoke negatively about the relationship between Quincy and his children. Shakur approached Kadada to apologize, and they immediately found a common language. Oh my god, he is so cute, Kadada thought at that moment. Soon, they started dating. At that time, Tupac was still married to Keisha Morris, but falling in love with Kadada prevailed, and soon he filed for divorce. Later, Tupac proposed to his new lover. Certainly, Quincy was not thrilled with such a suitor for his daughter, but since Kadada was madly in love, in the end, he decided to reconcile with the rapper. According to Quincy, Tupac apologized for what he said about him and his family. After that, they became very close. Despite the fact that Tupac found a muse for his new creations, his behavior after leaving prison left much to be desired. According to writer Kevin Powell, who spoke with Shakur after his release from prison, the performer seemed like a completely transformed person. Powell recalled that Shakur was more gloomy and menacing, so much so that he doubted whether he had known him before. But something about him has always remained the same, and that's his style. Tupac Shakur still serves as a source of inspiration for fans of streetwear and street fashion. Shakur often tied a bandana backwards, had a nose piercing, and turned anything into an object of the desires of millions. He didn't follow trends, 
He set them. Tupac wore everything with a slight carelessness that fully fitted to the image of a gangster rapper. He could hardly be seen from head to toe dressed in Gucci and other A-list brands. Tupac managed to create his own unique style without them. He combined the seemingly incongruous and even here remained unique. Dickies overalls, baggy tracksuits, flannel shirts, sports jerseys, panamas, work uniforms, and, of course, Timberland boots were the main elements of the rapper's wardrobe. Well, until we get to the story about the final chapter of Tupac's work, we remind you that you can subscribe to our channel so as not to miss new videos about the life of celebrities. Click on the subscribe button and the bell, and we continue. In the first weeks after his release from prison, Tupac continued to work at a frantic pace. Given the new agreements with Death Row, he was provided with everything he wanted in the studio. Two independent rooms were organized in which they simultaneously worked on different tracks for Tupac's album. He stopped halfway working on one record to start making another, and then came back. It was said that Tupac often stayed up all night after the recording staff fell asleep. He only took whiskey and cannabis. About four months later, All Eyes on Me was released. It was Shakur's new double album and one of the best in this genre of music, which determined the direction of its development on a global scale. The songs on the record combined melody and rhythm, told about the life difficulties of the black community, and contained a terrible expectation of soon passing away. This album received very favorable reviews. Despite some undeniable filler, it is easily the best production Tupac's ever had on record. In the first week after its release, the album sold 566,000 copies and entered the top 100 with the largest weekly sales, according to SoundScan, since 1991. All Eyes on Me won the Album of the Year Award at the Soul Train Music Award in 1997. Shakur also received an award in the category Favorite Rap Slash Hip Hop Artist at the 24th Annual American Music Awards Ceremony. Before that, rappers were afraid to release a large number of songs on their albums because of the risk of commercial failure. But Tupac was not afraid and created one of the most influential albums in the genre and forever secured the status of a hip hop icon of the 90s. After him, other artists began to release double albums. Gradually, Shakur was increasingly drawn into the rivalry between East Coast and West Coast artists, which began in the early 90s, and since the shooting at the rapper in November 1994, passions have strained to the limit. As the record company manager said, the trouble with what Pac was doing with this East Coast-West Coast thing was it was just something that got out of hand, a publicity thing. But brothers in the street think something is really going on, and they're gonna die for it. The war of words soon turned into violence in real life. When Tupac joined Death Row Records in October 1995, he automatically became part of the feud between Death Row and the Bad Boy label, which was founded by rapper Puff Daddy two years earlier. There were stories that Death Row contracts were ready to take revenge on everyone who was associated with Bad Boy. At one of the hip-hop parties, Tupac and Suge, with the help of other Death Row thugs, successfully cornered the promoter of the Bad Boy Records, tied him to a chair, and beat him with bottles. According to the police report, they even forced the Tide man to drink urine from a jar. Tupac's close friend later mentioned that when Shakur was with Knight, he became a different person. It was like Suga was trying to make the rapper act like a real gangster, and in fact, it worked. Tupac did not forget about his resentment towards his former friend. He took out all his anger and hit him up, diss on Notorious and Sean Combs. The track caused a wide resonance in the hip-hop community, and of course, it made Combs and all his artists angry. All but one. While the label was preparing for a series of retaliatory diss attacks on Tupac, the notorious B.I.G. said that anyone who even says a phrase to Shakur in the track, he will forget forever. And if the label releases anything in response to hit him up, it will mean the termination of the contract with the notorious B.I.G. It was unknown why Notorious was never able to talk to Tupac face to face properly. Perhaps Shakur did not want this, but there was an opinion that the label owners did not want this. The conflict sold much better than friendship. Any throw in about the next diss turned the record into platinum. Shakur didn't stop at one track. During 1995 to 1996, he created several more disses for artists of a competing label, as well as for other New York rappers Nas, Jay Z, and others. Tupac was supported by other Death Row musicians and even fans of the artists. The confrontation gradually turned into a real war of the coasts. Tupac's acting career also did not stand still. In 1996, he starred in two films, Road Ends with Tim Roth and Bullet. In the last project, the artist made a brilliant tandem with Mickey Rourke. In Bullet, the rapper played the role of a criminal authority named Tank, who wanted to get even with the main character for old cases, but eventually died anyway. And now we are approaching the moment, which to this day baffles connoisseurs of Shakur's work. The Don Caluminati, The Seven Day Theory, was Tupac Shakur's fifth and final studio album. 
The rapper wrote it in under the new stage name, Machiavelli. The album was completely finished in seven days in August 1996. The lyrics were written and recorded in just three days, and mixing took another four days. The emotions and anger shown on the lyrics have been and continue to be admired by a significant part of the hip-hop community, including other rappers. These were some of the last songs recorded by Tupac before the fatal shooting on September 7, 1996. George Papa G. Price, former head of Death Row Advertising, claimed that Machiavelli, which we did, was a sort of tongue-in-cheek, and it was not really to come out, and after Tupac was murdered, it did come out. But before that, it was going to be a sort of an underground. On November 5, 1996, the album was released to the world and ranked first place on the Billboard Top R&B slash Hip Hop Albums chart and the Billboard 200. It also had the second largest sales volume in its debut week among all albums of that year, selling 664,000 copies. According to Tupac's new pseudonym, it can be understood that shortly before his death he showed interest in the work of Niccolò Machiavelli. While in prison, he read many of his narratives. But the rapper's fans believe that the book The Art of War made the biggest impression on him since it described the staging of death in order to manipulate the enemy. Some believed that Shakur similarly sent his listeners hints that could help solve the mystery of his death in the future. And what do you think about this? Were there any messages encrypted in the lyrics of Tupac's songs? Be sure to share your opinion with us in the comments. On the night of September 7, 1996, Shakur attended a Bruce Seldon vs. Mike Tyson boxing match at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, along with Suga Knight, some Outlaws members, and other Death Row Records employees. After the match, one of Knight's assistants noticed Orlando Baby Lane Anderson, an alleged member of the Crips street gang from Compton, in the lobby of the MGM Grand. Crips was the largest gang in the United States, based mainly on the West Coast. It was believed that Shakur was involved in another street gang, Bloods, which was the main opponent of Crips. It was also known that he had friends and associates in the Crips gang, but he didn't officially connect to them. His friends recalled that the rapper tried to play on two fronts. He wore blue clothes when he was with Bloods and red when he hung out with Crips. These were the distinctive colors of the gangs. Stepbrother Moprim remembered a characteristic case. One day, there was a showdown at the comedy store. One of the gangs, part of the Crips, was looking for him, and Tupac, wearing a bulletproof vest and taking his weapon, came out to them. He said, Have you been looking for me, bitches? I'm here. To which the gang leader replied that Tupac was crazy and they would kill him later. Rumor had it that the conflict was later settled after all. Earlier that year, Anderson and a group of Crips robbed a member of Death Row's entourage at a Foot Locker store. Knight's associate told Shakur about this, and he attacked Anderson. Shakur's entourage, as well as Knight and his followers, joined the fight, which was recorded on a surveillance camera at the hotel. After that, Shakur, along with Knight, went to the 662 Club owned by Death Row. He was in Knight's black BMW as part of a large convoy that included many of Tupac's entourage. Shakur's bodyguard, Frank Alexander, asked Shakur to drive Shakur's fiancée, Kadata Jones's car, instead of accompanying him in case they needed extra cars to get from the club back to the hotel. At about 11.10 p.m., when they stopped at a red light at the intersection of Flamingo Road and Caval Lane in front of the Maxim Hotel, a car with two women in it drove up to their left. Shakur, who looked out through the sunroof, managed to chat with them and invite them to Club 662. At about 11.15 p.m., a white four-door Cadillac with an unknown number of passengers drove up to the sedan on the right side, rolled down the window, and quickly fired seven shots at the BMW. Shakur was wounded in the chest, pelvis, right arm, and hip. One of the bullets hit Shakur's right lung. Knight received a shrapnel wound to the head. One of the convoy's cars followed the Cadillac but did not catch up to it. After arriving at the scene, police and paramedics took Shakur and Knight to the University Medical Center of Southern Nevada. In the hospital, the rapper was connected to life support devices. On this rough, ill-fated night, his fiancée was next to him. Kidada Jones arrived at the hospital immediately after the call, which instantly blasted all hopes for a wonderful future together. Do you know I love you? Kadada said to him as he lay into the hospital bed. Do you know we all love you? Tupac nodded before he fell into a final coma. Kadada later wrote in her father's autobiography that Tupac was the love of her life. He and I lived together for four months, and then he was murdered in Las Vegas in 1996. It was the most horrible thing that ever happened to me. She also claimed that she felt they shouldn't have visited Las Vegas. I had a horrible feeling about it. I've gone over it in my mind a million times. It wasn't supposed to happen, Kadata recalled. While in the intensive care unit on the Friday afternoon, September 13, 1996, Shakur died of internal bleeding. 
Doctors tried to resuscitate him, but could not stop the bleeding, and Shakur's mother, Afini, decided to stop the doctors. He was pronounced dead at 1603. The official cause of death was named respiratory failure and cardiac arrest due to multiple gunshot wounds. Shakur's body was cremated the next day. The day the world found out about the rapper's death, Biggie called his wife Faith Evans. He was sobbing. I couldn't clearly make out what he was saying. He just cried and couldn't stop. Evans recalled, The woman claimed that Biggie was deeply shocked by what happened and did not want to talk to anyone for several days. Meanwhile, many were convinced that he was the one who ordered the murder of Tupac. However, the police have not been able to find convincing evidence. The culprit of the rapper's death has not been found so far. We two individual people, we waged a coastal beef. One man against one man made a whole west coast hate a whole east coast, and vice versa. And that really bugged me out. I've got to be the one to try to flip it. Because Pac can't be the one to try to squash it because he's gone. Biggie outlived his friend and enemy at the same time by only half a year. His car was shot by unknown people and the rapper died in the hospital without regaining consciousness. Thus, the War of the Coasts ended. Afini Shakur created a fund to support young, talented performers in memory of her son. On November 14, 2003, a documentary about the rapper called Tupac Resurrection was released under the direction of Afini Shakur and fully voiced by Tupac's voice. The film was nominated for the 2005 Academy Award in the category Best Documentary. The proceeds were sent to a charitable foundation established by Afini. There is also a clothing line called Machiavelli Branded, founded by Afini Shakur seven years after Tupac's death in memory of her son. Therefore, the memory of the work of a truly legendary rap artist will live on for many years to come. Tupac Shakur is still considered one of the most influential rappers of all time. In 2010, 50 Cent wrote in Rolling Stone magazine, Every rapper who grew up in the 90s owes something to Tupac. He didn't sound like anyone who came before him. Shakur's death shocked all fans of his work, so conspiracy theories about his death began to appear on the internet almost immediately. Many believed that Shakur could easily fake his own death and continue his life somewhere away from the eyes of his detractors. They explained this by the fact that there were many hints about his imminent death in Tupac's tracks in the last year of his life and, of course, many were haunted by his new stage name. Tupac Shakur passed away early enough and still had a lot to do and say. We talk about his murder in more detail in another video. There, you'll be able to find out the craziest theories of the rapper's death, and also find out if the theory that he staged his own death is possible. Be sure to click on the video that appeared on your screen and watch. And this is the end of our video. Thank you for watching it to the end. Don't forget to like it. There was Inco Stories with you. See you again.